Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's First Friday Forum. Uh, let's take a moment to thank today's First Friday Forum sponsors, Purveya Health, as well as our wonderful host, Elks Lodge Number 299, for a delicious meal. <laughs> Continuing our First Friday Forums is Devin Lemahue. Senator Lemahue is a native of Sheboygan County, attending Sheboygan County Christian High School before graduating with a BA in Business Administration and political science from Dort College in Sioux Center, Iowa. Devin is elected by his colleagues to serve as the Senate Majority Leader for the 2021-2022 legislative session, where he continues to lead the largest Republican majority in over 50 years. As the legislature addresses the challenges facing our communities and state, Senator Lemihu remains committed to pro-growth, pro-business policies, that will strengthen our vital manufacturing and agriculture economics economies and provide broad-based reforms to our job creators and families throughout the state. Please welcome Devin Lemahieu. Okay, I'll leave it here. <laughs> I'll leave it here, I guess, even though I'd rather walk around than be standing at a podium. Um, but thank you uh, to the Sheboygan Chamber for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, you know, I was, uh, I, I was given a month to prepare, and uh, as I was working on this, planning to work on this last night, um, then a Supreme Court a ruling hit yesterday afternoon, and I was on the phone from 6 till 11 o'clock last night talking to people. Um, so we'll see how this goes. So I was first elected to the Senate in 20, 2014. Uh, so I'm finishing up my, my second term here. And uh, and it's, you know, after four years, um, during my second term, um, I was fortunate enough to be appointed to serve on the Joint Finance Committee. So I got to go through that process of developing a budget uh, last session. And uh, with the departure of former Senator Fitzgerald to Congress uh, last December, the December before, a little over a year ago, uh, my colleagues elected me to serve as the Senate Majority Leader, which is a new role uh, leading the Senate. Um, I don't know if it's ideal to take over that role during a pandemic, um, but uh, had a couple stumbles along the way. But overall, I think we had a great session this year. So I'm gonna, I have a bunch of slides in here. Um, so I'm going to whip through them as quickly as possible. Just. Uh, and you can see the outline here, sort of about the uh, capital update, talk about the budget a little bit, um, the current economic climate that we're seeing here in Wisconsin, and some of the legislation that, that we're working on, and uh, then look forward to questions at the end. So um, we're wrapping up our floor session. So how a typical um, two-year cycle works is uh, we were elected in the fall of an even year, then during an odd year, we work throughout the entire year. Um, the governor introduces a budget at the beginning of, of a session and sends it to the legislature where the Joint Finance Committee puts its fingers on it and, uh, and our goal is to get that done by <coughs> July 1st, which is the beginning of our new biennial budget. And then the, and we're working on legislation all along. And uh, <coughs> by April 15, which is a little over a month from now, uh, that's when we take papers out to run again. So uh, that's sort of a, overall how a two-year cycle works. Uh, so we're finishing up. Our last floor date is March 8th. Um, the assembly has already adjourned, uh, which is maybe why there's no assemblymen in this room today. They're probably all vacationing, um, <laughs> taking an early vacation. But uh, but we're wrapping things up next week, and uh, then sort of the focus comes towards uh, the election cycle. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, currently we have a uh, 21 to 12 uh, Republican versus Democrats in the Senate. But, you know, I think we had a a really calm, relatively calm until our last session day. A good working, I had a great working relationship with the minority leader, um, trying to uh, run, you know, just keep her informed on the process and how the floor is going to work, bills that are coming up. Obviously, we don't agree on, on all issues, but uh, we actually had a pretty smooth session going forward. Um, so, yes, this is my first uh, session as Senate Majority Leader. Uh, there's been more than 100 uh, bipartisan bills that have been signed into law. And uh, we were focusing on some very important issues, as you can see, the economy, the workforce shortage, education, transportation, 
uh, the rise in crime since the beginning of the pandemic and things like that. So the biggest thing we do every, um, every two years is do a biennial budget. Um, it shows where our priorities lie in the state. Um, it's over $90 billion for the two years, uh, just to put that into perspective. Um, so our budget included um, both, as I mentioned earlier, the governor proposes a budget and his initial budget proposal, he increased um, <clears throat> uh, taxes by, his proposal increased taxes by more than a billion dollars. Um, had a 600, over $600 million deficit at the end of the two-year cycle. Um, what else did it do? Uh, had almost a 10% growth in spending and uh, also had a bunch of policy items. So the first thing we did was uh, remove out all the policy items, which cut the size of the budget about in half, and uh, we started working from there. Uh, so what we did is, um, and I'll go through this, but you know, after going through the process and producing a budget, it was great to have uh, bipartisan support in both houses. Uh, Democrats in both houses voted for, for the budget that went through the Finance Committee. By the way, Representative Terry Kotsma um, serves on the Joint Finance Committee, so he was a very important part in developing this budget. Um, but we, we produced a budget that had the most uh, legislators vote for it in over 20 years. And it's the first bipartisan budget in almost as long. The last bipartisan budget, there was actually split houses. One was controlled by Republicans and Democrats. So, so having a budget that um, had Democrats vote for it and the governor sign, um, I think is, is a great accomplishment to what we accomplished in the legislature this year. So some of the highlights of the budget, um, it cut income taxes by $2.4 billion. Um, it increased or uh, reduced property taxes by $650 million. Uh, we fully funded transportation, which I'll get into into more detail later, and uh, you know invested in core priorities of government. So first, I'll talk about the rainy day fund, and I have a graph coming up, sort of showing the history of the rainy day fund. Uh, but now our rainy day fund is at 1.7 billion dollars. Um, we ended the the budget. When we passed the budget, it was projected to have a surplus of a billion dollars. The budget that we passed, it is now increased, which I'll get to later. And uh, it's the first bo budget in a long time that had a positive gap um, balance, which if there's any accountants in the room, that's government generally accepted accounting principles. Um, um, we have to have a balanced budget every two years, but it doesn't use gap accounting principles. Faye can probably explain that to you later on. I see at least one accountant in the room. Um, and it had, had a surplus. So this shows our rainy day fund starting in 2009 to 2010, where we had $1.7 million in the rainy day fund. Um, in Governor Walker's first term, they passed a law that when you have a surplus at the end of, the bu of, of a budget, that half of that surplus goes directly into the rainy day fund. So that's how we saw the great increase of, of the rainy day fund over that period of time. Um, it is now capped, so we would have to actually do legislate because it went up to a certain percentage of the entire spending of the budget. Um, but uh, now we have uh, great reserves that in case we do hit another um, uh, uh, downturn in the economy, if we hit a downturn in the economy, we have that money set aside. On top of that, we'll, it's projected that at the end of our current budget that we're gonna have a $3.8 billion surplus at the end of it. Um, so unlike many of our surrounding states, we're in really good fiscal condition at this point of time. Um, this just shows the history since 2007 of, of our bonding, um, what we've done in bonding. So this, you can see, walk over here, I'll talk loudly. This was Governor Doyle's last budget, Governor Evers, or Governor Doyle's last budget, Governor Walker's first budget. This was when we were going through the last recession, so there was a lot of borrowing being done during this time. And as you can see, going forward, we've really taken control of the amount of borrowing that our state's done. Um, the, <clears throat> the blue line is through our general fund borrowing. The orange line is through the transportation um, fund. Um, when I was first elected, 25 cents of every dollar in transportation was going towards uh, debt service. 
um, and that's now down to about 17 cents on the dollar. So we've really moved our, our borrowing in the right direction. Our overall outstanding debt has gone down every year that I've been in office. So, so I'm sort of proud of the, the steps we've taken in, in reducing the, the debt burden on the state of Wisconsin. Um, a lot of what we do through the general fund in bonding is through the UW system with new buildings or updating old buildings, things like that. So a lot of the, the blue line that you see there from year to year, um, especially in the current, the recent budgets is, is uh, you know, building new buildings on, on UW campuses or updating buildings and things like that, general maintenance. Um, I stole this from one of my colleagues who's an accountant. Um, this shows our gap balance over the last um, 20 years. Uh, he likes to point out that he took over when it was at its highest and it's gone down since. I like to point out that I took over when it really started going down. Uh, yeah. That's when I was elected in 2014, but you can just see the trend of a decade of responsible budgeting, what it's been doing to our, our deficits. A little bit more about our, our tax cuts. Um, so our tax cuts, as I mentioned earlier, were divided up between uh, $2.4 uh, billion towards the income tax, and I'll show later how, that, how we sort of did that, and uh, $650 million for property taxes. Um, and we additionally put, uh, we also eliminated the personal property tax. Unfortunately, the governor vetoed that out of the budget because uh, he had some concerns over how we had that set up. He wanted it to um, increase with inflation and things like that. But uh, hopefully next session, as a small business owner, hopefully next session we can eliminate the personal property tax so I don't have to ever fill out that form again, which I just filled out like a week ago. Um, yes, like I said, the income tax cut, if you look, we the main bulk of it went into the third tax bracket, uh, which depending on how many dependents you have, you hit fairly early when you have a full-time job. Um, so. It, we reduced it from 6.27% down to 5.3%, um, which is a reduction of $1,000 for the typical Wisconsin family. And that's real savings. That's annually, that's going to go on into, well, hopefully eternity. Hopefully we don't raise taxes again. But uh, additionally, which I don't have any slides on this, um, four years ago when we passed the uh, a law requiring all online retails out of retailers out of state that they had to collect Wisconsin uh, sales tax if they're selling their items to people in Wisconsin. Half of the revenue that we get from that goes to reducing our income taxes. So that's also had a reduction as that number goes up every year to, uh, especially during the pandemic, we saw a huge windfall um, because of everybody ordering online instead of going out to store. So that's been slightly reducing our income taxes as well. This just shows graphically from budget to budget you know, how we've done um, reductions. My numbers are small. I didn't get a chance to update. I want to take some of these slides out. So some of them I might move through fast. Uh, this shows sort of the breakdown of our property tax cuts, um, which works out to $200 for the annual median valued home. But it's also important to note that local referendum has an impact on what you pay in property taxes. And I'm gonna show that on the next slide, I believe. Nope, slide after that. Uh, this just shows um, over the last five years what the effect that referendum, local referendum have had on, on property taxes. Uh, the gray box is, it's like if your local school district builds a new high school. So it's, it's building projects. Uh, the, Light blue is recurring referendum. So if they, if you pass a referendum to increase your levy limit going forward, and the <coughs> dark blue or purple, whatever color that is, is non-recurring referendum. So if you vote to increase over your levy for like a five-year period, so that just shows the effects of of referenda around the state of Wisconsin. <clears throat> This graph shows the uh, increase in spending in the transportation fund over the last uh, five years, and ne including next year in the budget that we passed. 
Uh, so as you can see, we've been steadily increasing our investment into transportation around the state of Wisconsin. Um, this highlights sort of the, the bonding issue again. Um, we've bonded in the past on transportation projects through the general fund and also through the transportation fund. Um, and this just shows that we've reduced, uh, this is through the general, uh, this is through the transportation fund, how we've in decreased that, that borrowing over that decade, because it's, yeah, over a decade. Highlights from the transportation uh, <clears throat> part of the budget. So once again, we did a one-time um, set aside a one-time amount of money. This the previous budget, I believe, was seventy-five million. Uh, this budget, we put a hundred million to be split up between towns, municipalities, and counties um, to help them get caught up on their their local road projects. Um, it was great on this last round that a bunch of these ended up in, in my district. Um, and hopefully we can uh, keep moving this forward in future budgets to make sure uh, local units of government can address the problems that they need most in there. Um, we also increased general transportation aids by 2% each year and uh, kept all state projects on, on point, such as the I-43 expansion down just south of here, Highway 23, which is gonna be done here soon, which is fantastic, and other projects around the state. <clears throat> Some other highlights from the budget, uh, we increased uh, the Tech College uh, funding by $2.25 million annually um, and also did some property tax through the Tech College's property tax relief. Uh, through DISPIS, the Department of Safety and Professional Services, uh, which is a, it's a licensing agency. Uh, which is important to a lot of different industries who who have employees who who are licensed uh, they've been having a hard time for as long as i've been elected being keeping caught up uh, with providing those licenses getting them through the system so we made a, an investment into their it system of 5.3 million so hopefully they can get caught up uh, tourism we we increase funding to tourism to try to get people into our state of wisconsin to drive that um, uh, sales tax revenue and tourism Hospitality, which is so important to especially this area of the state, Door County, Northern Wisconsin, things like that. And we also increased um, under uh, Department of Workforce Development, increased apprenticeships by one million and uh, did some other good things. Um, additionally, we included $129 million for broadband expansion and that can be coupled with the billion dollars that's coming in from the federal government um, we just actually passed a bill uh, last week to try direct that these sources um, to hit that last mile um, rather than you know upping where, where there's already high speed service providing multiple um, vendors in those areas to make sure that we're using taxpayer money to hit that last mile to the unserved not the underserved to make sure that you know if you're out in the country you have access to broadband um, and uh, also an important thing that we did is require WEDC uh, to use at least $3 million of existing funds for talent attraction and retention to try to try draw people into our state. Um, we did this under um, Governor Walker's last budget and we've seen some good results of trying to get people to move to Wisconsin and you know when I talk about the workforce shortage later on um, you know that's probably the biggest challenge that we hear about in the state of Wisconsin and others, but probably the biggest one. So as we all know, um, inflation has been a challenge um, lately in the state of Wisconsin. Um, I think I have it in a slide later that, um, so there's a couple reasons, I think, why inflation is, is having such a huge, is, is a problem right now. Uh, part of it is just the amount of federal money that's been pumped into the system since the start of the pandemic. In Wisconsin alone, if you add up um, the PPP loans, uh, the unemployment enhancement, uh, sh just straight checks to people, uh, the money that's gone into directly to local governments, schools, counties, municipalities, if you add all that up, I should probably play a guessing game to try to guess what this actual number is. And by the way, this has not all been spent yet, obviously. Um, 
It's, uh, does anyone want to try guess how much money has, in the last two years, has been earmarked and has been partially spent in Wisconsin? The size of our two-year budget is $92 billion, to give you a reference point. $100 billion. $100 The ARPA one was $5.8, $5.7 billion alone. You, you were high, um, actually, <laughs> but but $58 billion. So it's almost like an, it's over an extra year of government spending in our state, um, which is why you know all this money is being poured into the system. People are spending it. It's causing prices to go up. And then you combine that with the supply chain issues um, with you know shortage with trucking companies, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, it's really driving inflation. And becoming quite a problem as a small business owner who has some supply chain issues. So yeah, inflation is at 7.5% currently, which is a 40-year high. Um, obviously, yeah, there's there's the number. Good thing I didn't turn to this page. 58 billion. <laughs> um, this comes from a WMC survey, um, the impact of inflation on companies. Um, I'm not sure who the 9% of companies who find it positive, but 82% of companies find it, find it negative. Um, this just shows the 18-month price of gas, um, which is driving inflation in other products. And just a point, in Governor Evers' first budget, he proposed raising gas taxes by uh, 8 cents a gallon and then inde indexing it to inflation. So if we would have passed that, three, four years ago, uh, you'd now be paying an extra 10 cents per gallon um, and it'd be going up even more because of the high cost of inflation. So not only <clears throat> would gas be at 350 a gallon, it'd be at 360 a gallon at, at this point. So this is, since 2011, um, we've really, well, I haven't been there since 2011, I've been there since 2015, but the legislature has really worked on uh, reducing the tax burden in the economy. And if you look at all the taxes that we've reduced over the last uh, decade, it's it totals up to $22 billion. Um, we got that from the Nonpartisan Fiscal Bureau, who uh, tracks, tracks, keeps, does our accounting for us. Um, and this will, you know, what we did with reducing income taxes and things like that will help, at least help families somewhat combat inflation, things like that. And we went from the fifth highest tax burden state in 2009 to 23rd in 2019, which is the fastest decline um, over that 10-year uh, period. We talked about that already. I'm just going to talk about a couple of the bills that we've done, which I think are, are pro-growth and pro-business. Um, the first bill we did was sort of a response to COVID, um, AB1, and uh, you know helping hospitals deal with COVID and things like that. It was sort of a hot potato that went back between um, both houses for a while. Um, it, was, it was really fun being the new majority leader at that point. Um, but uh, ultimately, we got a bill signed into law by the governor, which was great. And it provided COVID liability protections for business, um, nonprofits, churches, schools. Um, so that way, you know, operating in this environment, we, you know, organizations don't have to worry about frivolous lawsuits. Um, we have the strongest protections um, of any state that has split government between Republicans and Democrats. And so I'm, it was great that we could get that bill done. Um, Senate Bill 189, which is actually the budget, um, repealed the personal property tax, which unfortunately was vetoed. Um, Assembly Bill 220 is um, encouraging youth apprenticeships, actually re requiring schools to focus on youth apprenticeships and let let uh, their inform their students of opportunities in that area to try, you know, fill that skills gap in in the labor market. Um, Senate Bill 629, these last three bills are actually on our calendar for next week and have already passed the assembly, um, is a helping WEDC work with uh, workforce housing uh, to try and encourage that, take, get, eliminate some of the um, red tape and things like that. 
Assembly Bill 932 is another bill promoting youth apprenticeships and 912 um, gives legislative oversight to future um, it uh, makes sure that no future governor can deem some businesses essential and some businesses non-essential that it has to be a standardized approach for a business um, not because personally I believe all businesses are essential so um, obviously the biggest challenge that businesses are facing is the the workforce um, and a lot of this is caused by the demographics of, of the state of Wisconsin, sort of an aging demographic, which is why it's so important that we're investing in talent attraction and you know, making sure our tax code is competitive and better than, than other states. And uh, it, I mean, you guys all know the unemployment numbers here in the three counties that I represent parts of, you know, 1.7%, 1.5%, 1.4%. Um, Fortunately, Wisconsin's uh, workforce participation rate is higher than, than what it is nationally, but it's still lower than what it was pre-pandemic. This is more from the WMC survey. Are you having trouble hiring employees? 88% um, of businesses are. Go through. I was planning on taking this slide out, but it shows um, over the last 20 years the <coughs> the labor, labor force participation rate went from 73%, now it's at 65%. So it just shows that trend. And some of that is, is an aging demographics, but we need to do at the state level anything we can do to incentivize people to get back into the workforce. Workforce solutions. There are currently 135,000 jobs on the uh, state of Wisconsin's website. Uh, so you can see sort of the challenge that all businesses are facing. Um, so we did a workforce package um, that we took up last week when we were on the floor. And um, if, if our bills are signed into law, it's estimated that 50,000 people will get back into the workforce. Um, <clears throat> just some highlights of the bills. Indexing UI benefits to unemployment rates. So the lower the unemployment rate is, the less amount of time uh, people can spend on unemployment. Um, if you ghost, you know, I'm sure if you guys are in the hiring process, you have people who apply for a job just to meet that, that requirement and then they never show up just so they can say they applied for the job. So if they sign up for interviews or schedule interviews and don't show up, then they lose a week of unemployment insurance just to incentivize people to actually do it. Um, the food share work requirement, this is for um, able-bodied adults without dependents um, that <laughs> that they have to have work requirements if they're going to collect food share. Um, and, you know, a bunch of other technical things to try. Um, probably the other important one is, you know, checking from system to system to make sure people are still eligible for unemployment, to make sure that there aren't people still collecting unemployment who shouldn't be collecting unemployment. So with that, I think I got done maybe quicker. I thought I had more slides than that, but I got done maybe a little quicker than I thought. Um, I would love to open it up to any questions that you guys might have. Um, yeah. Yes, Dave. Um, of the bills you just went through, which of those do you expect the governor will not sign? I don't know. Um, I, ho I hope he signs all of them. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Someone gave me some questions ahead of time, but I didn't have a chance to read it. So I'm going to read the questions out loud and let you guys think of questions. Senator, I'm going to comment while you're taking a look at that. Um, I'm at a meeting with Du Bois County, and sometimes I think people don't for granted Du Bois County, whether it's Beautiful Lake, Michigan, or whatever it may be. There's so many fun for us here. But if you think about our elected leadership, we have the governor from Du Bois County, we have the state Senate Majority Leader. Senator for his support for Highway 23. We're all so pleased to see that getting done. I also want to thank the Senator for his key leadership with the National Opioid Settlement, a nationally uh, 
every local unit of government that was involved with this lawsuit is going to see some opioid settlement come their way to help people in need. And Senator Lemieux was a key leader in Wisconsin. In fact, Wisconsin has one of the best uh, arrangements or opportunities to help people in need thanks to, to Devin's leadership. And, and if you aren't aware of it, Devin is a humble person. You're looking at an eight-time Iron Man standing up there. <laughs> he served on the county board, as did his dad before them. Both of them went on to serve in the Assembly and Senate, and uh, we're very proud of his leadership. So, Devin, thank you for your public service. I should bring Adam along to all my speaking <laughs> engagements. Thank you, Adam. No, it was great. I enjoyed my time on the county board. Uh, the nine years I spent uh, developed uh, two of my former colleagues back there, so it was great working on the county board. Um, I will read this question first. Assembly Speaker Robin Voss was reported recently visited uh, former President Trump at Mar-a-Laga, or however you say that, in Florida. The question is, would you please, I put my glasses back on, getting old, would you please uh, comment on why he visited him? I don't know if he did recently. I know he was uh, back in the summer. He uh, hopped on a plane with with the president. Um, you know, the uh, sort of gets us into election law, which I was hoping not to talk about tonight, today. But uh, you know, there there were a lot of concerns over the twenty twenty election. The election commission um, did some things that either the law gave them no ability to do, um, using the pandemic as an excuse to do it. Um, such as letting, not allowing people into nursing homes, uh, democracy in the park with drop boxes everywhere, uh, the Zuckerberg money being dropped just into the big cities, uh, things like that. Um, so there was a lot of concern over the last election. And uh, obviously our former president has been um, very vocal about his view of that election. Uh, we audited it with the nonpartisan audit bureau. Uh, Will, the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty also did an audit of it. And they found, you know, a lot of what we knew went on, um, that there was, you know, some municipalities uh, taking advantage of either places where the law didn't say that they could do it or, you know, sort of taking some liberties with that. Would it, did, it over, did it change the election results? I don't, no one will ever know, frankly, because, you know, who knows what went on at those areas. So we, uh, we just sent a host of bills to the governor using the Audit Bureau's um, suggestions, the Nonpartisan Audit Bureau, um, which has historically criticized both Republicans and Democrats. I mean, they, they, they're auditors, they do a great job. Um, so we took their suggestions, um, put it into legislation, and the uh, governor has said he's going to veto them, but uh, <laughs> we, we did our job to address those issues as much as, as much as we could as being one of three branches of government. Yes, ma'am. I wasn't going to bring it up. But you brought it up regarding <laughs> regarding the WEC, um, forgetting about drop boxes and all this other stuff that people are talking about. They haven't cleaned up the voter roll. What is the legislation going to do to uh, spank them or oversee them or something to make them clean up the voter rolls? For example, we have about four million voter legal voters in the state and yet there's over seven not formula yeah seven, there's over seven that are registered in the WEC well how can we have more voters than we have people so the answer to that question is the seven million are referring to are non active on the voter rolls and that tracks people who've been at current addresses so for example some addresses there may be like rental units on college campuses might have 30 people at that address. They're not active voters. It's having a history of who's voted at those places. The active voter list is cleaned up and because of a law that I passed my second session using um, Eric uh, by mailing up postcards to people who haven't voted in the last, forget all the details, but haven't voted in the last four elections. Um, Unfortunately, it took WEC to institute it before the last election, but they now have cleaned, used that to eliminate those from, from the rolls. Um, 
and that's an ongoing process as well as people who are registering to you know go with, with death certificates um, real estate transactions you know all state state records to sort of true them together just another question you talked about the median home value is there a, a number that you have for that or how is that arrived at are they using the tax assessed values or are they using market values or what are they using to arrive at this median home value it's it's the assessed value the question was what what is the median home value and it's the it's based off the assessed value which you know rises but it's the it's not the average it's the median so the middle house in the the fictitious middle valued house in the state of Wisconsin. Yes. Uh, my name is Benjamin Horvath. I, I have two questions, one particular to what you just mentioned. A business associate of mine said that there was a independent council uh, that recently, uh, I guess last week, that showed these findings of, of the 2020 election. Is that what you were referring to uh, just now when you said that there was an audit or is that something separate? You said within the last week? Uh, that the findings came out um, supposedly during the week when it was released to you. Right. Um, so, th as far as I know, there's been three audits done. Uh, the one which both houses of the legislator did, legislature did through the Nonpartisan Audit Bureau. We got those results in like October of last year. Uh, Will, the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty, uh, did their own audit. Um, um, and that came out last fall as well. Um, and the assembly, through the speaker, hired former Justice Gableman to do his own audit. And that he issued a report uh, Tuesday this week. And there was a hearing on it. And I haven't had a chance, I've been a little busy this week, um, haven't had a chance to actually read that um, audit yet. But uh, I look forward, that's on my list of things to do this weekend. Okay, great. Um, that must be what my, my friend was referring to. Uh, secondly, totally different subject. Uh, we're a, a startup factory process in the environmental sector, and um, it seems oftentimes that Democrats have been known as the environmental party, where they they kind of get all of the credit for being environmentally conscious. Um, and as a Republican, I I don't agree with that. <laughs> but how uh, how can Republicans? regain the ground of saying we care about the environment we're we're not hysterical about it but we care and we're responsible and and what can we do for uh for businesses that uh, are are looking to move into that sector that is a fantastic question i'd love to sit down with you and pick your brain on, on ideas and how to do that you know we've uh i think we've we've done some bills uh to address like the PFAS issue up in, um, especially up in the, like the Marinette area of, of the state. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of a bunch of things we've done over the last mm -hmm. eight years that I've been around. I don't, I'm not on the Natural Resources Committee, so you know, I don't work on them directly, a lot of those bills. Um, but you know, even a lot of the things we've done for sporting heritage and things like that, um, you know, we invest in stewardship uh, we've increased stewardship spending. Well, we've kept it steady uh, to help you know local counties and municipalities to and groups to um, purchase land uh, through the stewardship program for recreation um, or parks and things like that. I know back when I was on the county board, we had a big one for the Amsterdam Dunes down in the southern part of the county, uh, which the state has helped out. So you know we've we've invested in stewardship uh, things like that, but. Um, definitely love to, uh, you know, sort of, it's, it's interesting that a lot of the, the Democrats have wanted to like increase the renewable energy standard from, I think it's at 10% now to like 25%, 50%, things like that. We don't need to have a government mandate to do that because it's some of the renewable energy is becoming more affordable and power producing uh, places are adding more solar farms, more and different things. And it's good to have a diverse um, energy portfolio, but it's also important to have 
something that's going to always be producing energy. And that's typically a fossil fuel uh, type, type of power plant because we can't, as we all know as business owners, if you're, especially if you're running a factory, you can't have brownouts and rolling outages and things like that. So, so yeah, I think we often see um, the role of government differently in the area of the environment. You know, it's, it's maybe incentivizing, not hammering people for, for doing things. I think I saw another hand up. Back there. Um, a comment first and then a question. Frank Lillian from the Judge in the Milwaukee Journal, just to the rule unconstitutional, the Robin Voss gave him a um, referring to the 2020 election, which started in October of last year for the 600 some thousand taxpayers' money, was. Um, extended to December, then was extended to February, and of course it's going to be appealed. The question is, when does this all end? Do you have any idea? Um, I, I will leave that up to the speaker to answer that question when he's going to um, stop his Gableman investigation. Um, he asked me to join him back um, last summer, and you know, I was comfortable with what the Audit Bureau was doing, and I knew that Will was very, I trust Will um, as investigators um, doing their jobs, so I didn't feel we needed another another investigation going on. Um, but uh, um, I, you know, regardless of how you believe what went on in 2020, I think we need to focus on 2022. I mean, we can see we're not going to be able to pass any laws without a new governor, apparently on cheering up our elections. Um, we can either be like Georgia, where Republicans sat home and Democrats won, or it could be like Virginia, where Republicans were energized and came up and won. So that's my focus is on obviously identifying some of the areas we can clean up in state law, which we're doing through the legislative process, but we're going to need a new governor to get that signed into law. Do you know what attorneys bought the deal that they're making all the money? I do not know which attorneys he's using. Could it be Folio Nardner or Coyle de Brain or Joe Usor is working out? I don't think it is. In your presentation, you had pointed out um, these apprenticeships in two different areas. Um, can you tell us a little bit more mechanically how, with those, with those bills, how um, the messaging of youth apprenticeships is going to get maybe a, a broader scope. I know Lakeshore Technical College does a terrific job with the youth apprenticeships because when I worked at Steam McLean Traction Company, um, I had a number of youth apprentices that, that went forward. Um, but how how are, are or what is the plan to try to you know make that more of a broad brush mm -hmm. across the state when it comes to Right, so the question is regarding the couple bills that I had up there about youth apprenticeships, and as you stated, LTC does a fantastic job um, with their youth apprenticeship program, uh, partnering with high schools and businesses to, uh, to give that opportunity for high schoolers to get their foot in the door, to provide some work experience, to show how vital manufacturing is to the area, um, which is probably why I didn't dig into those bills as much as I should have because I think we're doing it really well here. But it's, you know, we see this problem all over the state where where there's a workforce shortage. Um, you know, we have seen a good I've seen in the last decade, sort of um, a change in view from uh, schools to not just push kids into, you know, universities and, and four year colleges, and highlight, you know, you can get a great job if you go to. LTC for two years, no debt. You develop that you can work as you're when you're going through it, earn some money. You can be 20, 21 years, 19 years old and uh, get a great paying job. Whereas maybe some of your classmates are getting their, I should downgrade higher education too much. And so I think I learned a lot in my four year uh, liberal arts degree, but uh, I worked hard through there and left without a whole lot of debt myself. So, um, but yeah. I think it's, it's just important to give kids multiple options in all directions to make sure that we can find the, the correct path for them and not maybe not have them waste four years in, in 
in college, but it's funny, we had our, maybe not funny, ironic, um, we had our LTC breakfast with legislators this morning and they bring in some of their students who've come through different, different paths. And uh, there's, I was talking to one student who has a political science degree from a, a liberal arts college and is now back at LTC a couple of years later uh, getting a two year human resource um, degree. And I'm like, well, I'm, I have a political science degree too, so I don't know what job skills I have if I if I lose one of these years. But uh, maybe I'll have to go back to LTC. <laughs> Saw someone else's hand up. Maybe I didn't see someone else's hand. Yes, Faye. Hey. So we have this, I'm gonna editorialize my opinion here. Um, this is my opinion only. I think there's two ways to rehabilitate people. One is to teach them job skills. Um, and we do that uh, to those who are, we, we still need to increase the funding on that for our, our state prison system. Um, but yes, provide job skill training in that um, unfortunately, not all uh, inmates are willing to do that or cooperate and things like that. Um, but I think the other way is through um, finding Christ. Um, I think to turn their life around, and which is why I personally support the uh, chaplain here in Sheboygan County financially, because the best way to have someone not get locked up again is to have, a, have their life changed, to find a reason not to commit crimes. Um, but yes, in, in our in our state prison system, we do job skills. We started now with um, treatment for drug problems and things like that too. It, we, it obviously still needs work, but I mean, I think a bigger point to this is since the pandemic, we've seen uh, homicides and murders increase. We've seen car thefts increase. Um, we've seen judges let, I mean, I'm sure there are people who are maybe wrongfully locked up, um, but there are a lot of people who are committing crimes, especially in urban areas, that are increasing and need to um, be punished and pay the crime. Because if there are no consequences for your action, these crimes are only going to go up. And, you know, obviously the biggest issue in our state is the workforce challenge. Um, probably secondarily is the housing challenge. But we have a great state 
and trying to track people and keep them in this state um, through you know, certainty in the business climate, reducing taxes, uh, making sure we have clean lakes, a beautiful environment to recreate. But if people don't feel safe in this state, why would they stay here? I, or live in an urban area if they don't feel safe. So, I mean, there needs to be consequences for crime. And yeah, I'm sure there's things we can do better. And we'll still continue to try working on teaching job skills, but some people don't want to learn those. Yes. So, um, as far as workforce, I'm just curious, maybe just anecdotally in conversations you hear around the state capitol, um, you know, eight states don't have a uh, state tax, or and then New Hampshire doesn't have an earned income tax. Are there any discussions like that to make us one of the only states in the Midwest without a earned tax or a state tax? You know, it's something. I think property tax is the highest revenue that Wisconsin gets. So, you know, to, to have Either maybe a cap income cap, or that below it nobody would pay, pay tax or anything. Maybe to incentivize either incomes or anything coming into positions that you know that to attract some workforce. So just wondering if you had right. Um, there was just a bill introduced within the last couple of weeks. Um, obviously, we're at the end of session, so it's not going to get enacted right now. Um, to increase sales tax by I think it was three and a half cents um, and eliminate the income tax. Um, that doesn't quite cover it. That if you use if you don't use dynamic scoring, um, I think we're working towards reducing the income tax rate as fast as we can. I know Tennessee um, eliminated theirs by increasing their sales tax by like five cents or something. So they have like a ten cent um, sales tax. A lot of the states that don't have income taxes have a major state revenue source such as oil um, or things like that to offset. The loss of an income tax, but no, I I agree with you that the lower we can um, reduce our income taxes, it's more beneficial for for our state long term, uh, keeping um, companies here, keeping higher paid employees. But I think we need to think. So when um, President Trump um, decreased the corporate tax rate, a lot of small businesses shifted their how they're taking income from income revenue to corporate revenue because that tax was lower overall. And so in Wisconsin, we saw a huge increase in corporate in, corporate income taxes rather than personal income taxes. So when you make a huge change like that, you have to think through how is business going to change how income is paid out. And you know, think of everything before you do that just to make sure you're not causing just a huge shift in taking huge losses elsewhere. But, you know, I, I mean, we've been hitting at it. Um, we still have a long ways to go, but uh, uh, hopefully we can make some more transformational with, with our surpluses and our current higher revenue, make some more um, long-term uh, income tax reductions in the next budget. Got me for two more minutes. Yes. Just a question as to the state's uh, stance on local control of where, for example, a wind farm is going to be sited. Um, I don't know how much you're aware of the issues with wind farms, but to me they're completely not renewable because it's the heavy metal or the, the rare earth metal um, mining in China. If, if you saw any of those pictures, it's horrible. Okay, it's not in our backyard, but it's still it's still a big problem. And then you have all the fuel that's used to transport from place to place and ship these things all over. You have the fact that at least it used to be that anytime they changed hands, they got a new government handout. I, I'm not sure what the source, I think it was federal. Um, and I don't know if it's still happening, but that used to be the case. So you could have a wind company and change name and sell it and keep getting the same bailout all the time. Um, these things do affect property values tremendously. So what you're doing when you're allowing something to come in is you're saying to those homeowners that what they worked for and their equity in their house doesn't matter. Uh, in addition, it causes severe health issues with uh, both people and livestock and wildlife. So my understanding is that 
somehow the energy companies have gone to the state and at the state level said, well, we want to come in here and do this and try to bypass local input. Is there anything or any plans that you have put in place where this cannot happen and so that the local governing authority will be able to say, no, you can't blow your way into this? Um, that was a long question about wind farms uh, yes. to those who couldn't hear. Um, you know, if you contact my office, I can clarify any of that for you. Um, I do, I'm pretty sure local governments can deny that because I know that there was a solar farm. I don't know about wind farms. Not with wind farms? Uh, okay. Who with solar farms. Had, who's in the, whose house is being threatened yep. by it right now? Yep. Someone in the renewable energy field who could probably answer the question better than I can. <laughs> uh, we're actually a recycling process, not with waste energy, but uh, but I would comment. I think the best fortification against uh, property values being hurt and, and mm -hmm. local communities being hurt is really the facts. Uh, if you look at the the, uh, the total score of uh, carbon emissions and and the total life cycle of that technology uh, is more of a mixed bag than some would say. And I, so I think empowering uh, local people to understand the whole picture rather than uh, a perspective that is somewhat skewed to only the information they want you to hear about it being beneficial, I, I think would actually uh, cause uh, more benefit and, and more protection for local communities that could be hurt by the technology just because they say, you know, we have to save the whales, um, so we, we have to do this regardless of the weather hurts you. Um, and, and the facts point otherwise when you actually know the big picture. So I'd love to, to see some of that information be uh, presented. And I think there's been many uh, areas in the last couple of years where we've, we've been presented a set of the facts and the, the other facts are not allowed to be presented. And that, that lack of free speech, lack of equal footing for the facts, uh, whether we disagree or not, just have to uh, take place in, in the, the years to come. We can't allow that to happen anymore. And so I think Republicans have to say, we know the facts also, and we're only presenting some of them. We're going to present the whole picture, and then we're going to let the American people decide. It's past one o'clock, so thank you, Chamber, for inviting me. Thank you.